we're nearly ready? Am I on? Am I on? <laughs> okay, let's start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the MCA. Um, I'd first like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land uh, and the waters that we meet upon, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and also to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait uh, uh, peoples here today. Welcome. My name's Jill Nicholl and I'm Director of Audience Engagement here at the MCA. I'm thrilled to uh, be asked to welcome you to this panel discussion as part of the opening events for the National 2017 New Australian Art. The National presents the latest uh, ideas and forms in contemporary Australian art curated across three of Sydney's major cultural organisations, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, Carriage Works and the MCA. It's a six-year initiative presenting three editions in 2017. Da-da, we're here, it's open. 2019 and 2021. And the curatorial vision for the exhibition represents a mix of emerging, mid-career and established artists from across the whole of Australia. New and commissioned works encompass a diverse range of mediums, including painting, video, sculpture, installation, drawing, performance, all the stuff. It's truly a, a snapshot, a lens onto what's happening now uh, within contemporary art practice in this country. Uh, the panel today was created as a reflection on the processes on which the three organisations have encountered in the creation of, of this whole, this whole programme. Uh, what it means to have a six-year exhibition, uh, what it means to work in this way and how it connects to other existing exhibition models. Uh, maybe some of the questions that we'll be looking at and trying to answer are what is the role of collaboration within such different models? Why is there a thirst nationally and internationally to work in this way and in these ways? And what can we learn from contemporary artists today? Probably everything. Okay, so I'll just um, introduce our wonderful uh, panel of guests that we have here. First of all, moderating the panel is Charlotte Day, who's here, Director of Monash University Museum of Art in Melbourne. Um, next to her is uh, Mami, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, Mami Kata Oka. Apologies, Mami, I hope I did that right. So Mami is the Artistic Director of the upcoming 21st Biennale of Sydney, so next year. She, was the chief she is the Chief Curator at the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo and has engaged in projects before, such as the Guanji Biennale in 2012 and was previously the International Curator at the Hayward Gallery in London. Next to her is my wonderful colleague Blair French, who's Director of Curatorial and Digital here at the MCA and one of the curators of the National. Some of his curatorial projects include the sixth and the seventh iterations of the Scape Public Art Christchurch Biennial, as well as working on Australian Perspecta 1997 and 1999. And indeed, last night, uh, Perspecta came up in a few conversations that I was having, so maybe you'll be touching on some of that today. Um, Next to Blair is Wayne Tunnicliffe, Head Curator of Australian Art at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and one of the curators of the National. Most recently, he was Curatorial Advisor for Australia's Impressionists, 2016-17 at the National Gallery in London. And then we have Nina, Nina Mile, Curator at Carriage Works, and one of the curators of the National. Uh, formerly a Director of Haunch of Venison in London, and previously a trustee of the non-profit space Beaconsfield. And then finally, welcome to Ruben Keenan, coming all the way from the cyclone, <laughs> a curator of contemporary Asian art at Quagoma in Brisbane, where he's been a core curator for the 7th, 8th and currently 9th Asian Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art. So that's enough um, from me, and let's just have a warm welcome to everybody. Thanks so much for the... Um Great welcome and introduction. Uh, I think it was advertised as being an hour and a half, this talk, but we're going to aim for about an hour, just so people can have lunch <laughs> and keep fresh. Um, so we'll do about 45 minutes together and then open it up uh, to questions and um, feedback and comments. And um, I mean, we have got a strong national constituency here, but it's not only about the national. So we're gonna start with some kind of bigger, broader questions and then narrow it in. So firstly, um, I thought we could talk a bit about some historical precedents and particularly how with certain events like the Sydney Biennale or the Asia Pacific Triennial, 
how um, the history of them might inform how um, curators work with them today. And we're very lucky to have Mammy with us, who's obviously in that headspace very much at the moment as she works towards her Sydney Biennale. So we might start with you, Mammy, how you've looked to the history of the Sydney Biennale and how it's informing your approach to your exhibition. Um, I'm still in the process of learning what was the importance or significance of Biennale of Sydney since 1973 and uh, we are planning some of the series of uh, archive stories so that I see among all these Sydney based or Australian based audiences you have gone through so many uh, Biennales already so I'm trying to sort of take out some of the stories from the people who had experienced and uh, one of our board, Penelope, had seen everything from 1973. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's important to see what role that Biennial had uh, played in this uh, Sydney and also Australian community. But again, uh, you can also see the development of institutions along the way that uh, MCA opened in 91 and then also uh, APT started. So uh, I think a role has been changed. And that's one of the interests that I'm looking at. Because with the uh, early Sydney Biennale, Sydney Biennale was the third Biennale in the world after Venice and Sao Paulo, I think. Um, so it was very much about putting Sydney and by extension other parts of Australia perhaps um, onto a global or a international platform. But as you said, now that there are many more organisations working more um, frequently, internationally or with international artists, you know, that kind of core role is not quite the same, is it? Yeah, because I, I assume that uh, it was only Art Gallery New South Wales that had shown uh, what, what became a venue because first biannuals only happened at the uh, Sydney Opera House in 1973, just using this sort of public space. And it's, it was only second time, 76, that started to use a museum space and had been a, a collaborator for the scenes. But uh, yeah, it's that this uh, venue had been added whenever new uh, institution came up. So the Asia Pacific Triennial was established about 20 years later, I think. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty right. bad with my maths. So I had no, to no, do it no. on my you're, phone. Like you're you're right on, but I, I actually had to think that through, yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. okay. And um, obviously it had, was designed to have a very specific regional focus. Do you want to talk a bit about that, Ruben, and the, you know, the kind of motivation for its establishment? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a long story, so I, I will try to be brief, just... Um, uh, you know, thinking about time, but um, it was an interesting um, uh, exhibition model, I think, um, in that it came out of a particular ferment, a uh, particular time uh, within Australia when uh, there was uh, a much greater orientation, uh, particularly in trade terms, um, but also um, uh, roughly two decades worth of, um, of immigration from um, Asia and the Pacific. And... Uh, the Queensland Art Gallery um, had uh, platformed uh, quite a few interesting exhibitions that were already dealing with questions that perhaps problematised um, your American models of thinking about um, contemporary art and what contemporary art is and asked the question of how relevant is that to um, Australian society um, today at that particular time. Uh, so there was an exhibition in 1989 of contemporary Japanese art, Japanese ways, Western means, um, with around 40 artists. Uh, that was quite substantial. Um, very important exhibition called Balance 1990, which looked at, um, at structuring dialogues between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australian artists. Um, and that, uh, uh, that really kind of gave rise to this idea of uh, building a fairly rigorous structure to explore the work um, of the region. So the very first uh, APT was um, perhaps smaller in scope, um, in geographic scope, than, than the, um, the APT has grown today. Um, it covered and was quite explicit about covering the regions of uh, the South Pacific, Southeast Asia and East Asia. Um, and uh, within that, actually having um, uh, uh, quite national focuses so that um, each of the countries um, represented 
um, was shown as a, as a group of artists from, from that particular country. And was that because of a kind of funding model, do you think, or that was more just the framework that the work was considered? Uh, I think it was the, the start of a framework. I mean, um, there are a couple of precedents in the sense that the, the Venice Biennale, uh, with its national pavilions, um, provides a way for thinking about the, the work um, of a given context um, within a fairly focused way. Um, it was the very first exhibition um, uh, in this series to actually explore context that the audience might not be particularly familiar with, so it provided an opportunity um, to really display a range of practices and to publish writing that was quite focused on those uh, contexts. And I um, remember that as much as the exhibition itself, it was all also the public programs and events around it. It was like really um, developing a meeting place for especially artists and curators and people working in the region to come together. Yeah and talk in that I felt at the time was like something pretty important. Yeah, that was that was really interesting. It was a time when I guess uh, a few of these hubs were emerging. Um, they, they weren't the first exhibitions to, to do this. Th there actually had been uh, biennial and triennial events um, throughout Asia and uh, the Middle East from uh, from the 1950s right through. Tokyo had a, a quite a substantial um, biennale. Um, and uh, for instance, there was the uh, the Indian Sculpture Triennial as well, um, and even in Australia, uh, things like the Mildura Sculpture Triennial, um, the, and the single edition of the um, Pacific Biennial, I think it was as it was known in 1976 in New Zealand, um, that had started to ask questions about the region. Um, the Fukuoka Asian Art Show is a really important precedent, beginning in 1979, and then evolving into quite directly the Fukuoka Triennial and in uh, 99. Um, so uh, it, was, it was a chance to actually add, I guess, a, a hub for this kind of discussion. And it's been interesting to talk to um, a number of artists who were active at that time and find that um, through these kind of initiatives, it was really the first time that um, a lot of these people working in countries that were very close to each other, cities that were often very short distances, were actually able to meet face to face and talk and see each other's work. So that was extremely important. Um, so as much as being an exhibition, it was a it was a meeting place, as you say. Now the national pause, <laughs> pause, Wayne, pause. That sounded uh, ominous, <laughs> Charlotte. Come on. No, 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 I'm not serious. Um, so this is a brand new event, and it's been promoted as go there's going to be three iterations. In we think so far. Um, so would you like to talk a bit about? Um, the precedent, perhaps, that have informed this happening or um, the background to coming together to present this exhibition? We'll, let, we'll see them, you know, this struggle to... This yeah. is collaboration at work. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Sharing it out. Um, as Blair just mentioned to me, would I like to talk about perspective, which I can, which is an obvious precedent for this exhibition. Um, something I just want to say in response to Ruben, um, something which differentiated the APT from the beginning was that it was actually a collection building exercise as well. So the legacy within this country has been remarkable for the artworks which remained afterwards. So for me, that's one of the really strong things which came from that model. Um, going back into our history in um, Sydney, something which has come to me often during this process is people talking about Perspective, which many of you would know, and for those of you which don't, was a biennial exhibition which happened on the opposite year to the Biennale, like the National. So it was kind of developed in response to the Biennale in some it was, ways. It was, and in 1981 was the first one, um, which Bernice Murphy curated um, when she was curator of contemporary art at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. And it was just at the Art Gallery to start with? It was, and it remained just at the Art Gallery to 1995. So the model was um, a survey type show, it tended to be generally non-thematic, I uh, happened every second year just at the Arco New South Wales. It was in-house curators to 1995 and Judy and Nia did the one in 1995. Um, at that point it moved into a collaborative multi-venue model. So 97, which was the art and nature theme, thematic, many venues across Sydney. And then 99, which Blair and I both worked on as well, I also worked on the 97 one, was the art and politics. And I think we peaked at 22 
collaborators, um, which as a curatorial leader almost killed us, I have to say. It was unsustainable as a model um, in terms of resources with an institution and labour. Um, but this big shift happened from the 1995 single curator, single institution model really occurred when the art gallery's priority shifted during that time. So I have to say none of the curatorial staff want to let go, um, but from the director directorial side there was a perception that um, when it was invented in 1981 there were a lot less opportunities for contemporary art in Sydney. Um, I don't think art space was founded yet, that was soon after though, just after. Uh, performance space, all the MCA didn't exist, all the many organisations showing contemporary art didn't exist in 81 when it was started. Um, and that was an incentive for it to begin. A feeling that had moved on, and also the art gallery in the mid 90s, there was increasing pressure on our program. And a sense of rather than doing one large survey type show, to do a series of smaller, more thematically focused exhibitions throughout the program instead. So that was really the shift. Um, the curators didn't want to let go, so we went to the invitational expanded model for 97, 99, and then finally just had to think, we can't actually continue with this. So I think that was my perspective. Blair, you may have a... No, that, that's, I'm, as one of the um, people working one of the smaller, if you like, um, organisations that was invited in and I guess a dispersed part of that project. It was incredibly exciting to begin with, but very quickly felt that you were involved in something that you actually didn't understand what was going on around you to a certain extent. It was impossible to have that um, constant kind of dialogue within the group and understand where it was going. I think it made for quite an interesting, particularly the 99 show, a really interesting sort of model uh, as an audience encounter. There was just so many modalities of activity from Radio National doing things to large run spaces in Western Sydney, etc. I mean, I think that that was a real strength, but it had that kind of festival model almost. So it um, it was the sum. It was it was its parts. It didn't really come together, and I think that was um, everyone found that a little bit hard to hold on to working in organisations. But it was certainly in our mind to come to the second part of your question about the national. It was certainly in the back of our mind in our conversations, and it started about probably about three years ago, um, with the conversations between the organisations about um, how we can work together, what would be the value of working together. Um, and it was very very conscious that in many ways we, we sort of um, obliquely work together. So through the Biennale, we're all involved in the Biennale as organisations, but that means we have these relationships, individual relationships into the Biennale, but not necessarily talking to each other around the Biennale, for example. Um, and I think we also had, you know, new staff moving through organisations and, and who'd worked together in different ways in the past interested in doing so. So we, had, we started a conversation about you know, how could we work together, what would be the value of it. Um, a parallel conversation was, well, wh what's our shared space? You know, what, what is it that all three of us actually are passionate about and do? Because we all are very different organisations. Um, we have different histories, we have actually different models of working with collections and non-collections, performance and carriage works case more so than the others, etc. So. And contemporary Australian art is our shared space. Um, and how does it um, relate to something like the Adelaide Biennial that's well, been running for quite a long yeah. time and is also mm. um, sees itself, I think, as a national platform for when Australian art? When did it start? The uh, when did it start? 1990. 1990. 1990. There we go. Oh, 19. Well, according to me, but could be wrong. 1988, according to me. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, how does it relate to Adelaide? Uh, or does it or not? Of course it does. I mean, you can, have, you, can have, you can have more than one national platform. I think the other thing that we were having in that conversation was this, this sense of an absence in the city, um, a sense of, you know, we didn't have, we were all doing lots of things, and not just our organisations, but a number of organisations doing incredible things across the city, but it's very dispersed. And what we don't have is this moment, this really serious, substantial looking at what is happening in Australian art now. Now, yes, Adelaide does do that, but the resources of three organisations coming together can kind of lift that scale. But also, you know, there are wide audiences, large audiences that come through our organisations that are not going to see Adelaide. So I think you know, they're not going to go see that well, show, that's sorry. Tough. They might otherwise see yeah. yeah. But you know, they're just, they're not. They're not necessarily that kind of committed professional well, art going. Much bigger city and much more. So the, the capacity to, to expose work 
to a really substantial platform of visitors exists here and existed if we came together. And so it's also just a very simple matter of scale. We can do something on a real scale together that none of us could do individually. And Nina, were you going to say add to that? I was just going to say that another of the kind of distinguishing features of the National, I think, is this almost polyphonic curatorial model. Um, you know, as we've discussed, it was kind of grounded very much in, in collaboration, um, not only between the three institutions and all the artists we worked with, but a number of writers from around the country, um, various other uh, sounding boards that we consulted in our, in our independent research. Um, so I think, and I think the question of um, multiple curatorial voices is a really interesting one and um, obviously tied very closely to the growing collaboration we see, you know, among biennales worldwide. And in some cases, this kind of devolution of curatorial responsibility as um, uber curators surround themselves with kind of cultural attaches or people who have a more in-depth regional expertise. Um, so that when a curator from London parachutes into Guangzhou and, and mounts a biennial there, it, um, doesn't feel completely disconnected from place. You know, they've they've done their own research, but they also have people m far more embedded in the region who, um, you know, have been vital sounding boards and and helped kind of ground the Biennale. You've moved things ahead, of Nina, further than I was anticipating, but Sorry, but gosh. we can go with that. Um, <laughs> just before we do, just one. Did you consider it being? Um, New South Wales, Sydney focused rather than national? Like Melbourne now. Well, Sydney no. now. <laughs> no, we Just, thought the I national. I mean, it's not all about Sydney sometimes, you know, or <laughs> is, or it could be. Um, did you consider that or it was important? from the outset that it would be So national. saying to respond to that, just actually to wind slightly back to one of Blair's points, the difference between the Adelaide Biennial, I think that a question of audience is really important. I mean, we would all go to Adelaide to say, see the Biennial. There's probably two or 300 people from around Australia who'd fly in for that, but otherwise it's a local audience. And here, and particularly at the Arcadon New South Wales, but I'm sure at the MCA and Carriage Works, we've got a very local audience as well. Huge schools visitation, people who are not travelling down to Adelaide to see their terrific exhibitions. So for us to actually present that sort of, um, you know, it, it taking the temperature of contemporary Australian art, as we've said in a couple of press releases, um, and presenting to a very broad audience, I think, is incredibly important. Um, we weren't particularly interested in just looking at Sydney or New South Wales and having that sort of um, regional focus. We want to look across the whole country, um, but also internationally. So to really expand the idea of what the national could be. So calling it the national is a provocation, of course. There's no question. But we're doing an Australian show. The parameters were Australian, so let's own that. Let's explore that. And I think the title national does push towards discussing the issues around national borders, boundaries, nation states, etc. But apart from artists around Australia, we've got quite a few artists who are living and working overseas, artists based here who exhibit overseas and have substantial careers there. So it's expanded sense of that Very idea. expanded sense and, and looking at the porosity of being in the world in this current moment. I mean, it's... I mean, probably a way that connects a bit to how the British art show works. Because that yeah, often or the Whitney Biennial or Whitney, yeah. yeah. Um, do you imagine that it could exist in other places apart from the people who lead it and its institutions? I mean, it could had could it have a travelling life, a kind of an extension beyond Sydney? We actually haven't had any of those discussions yet. I think it's fair to say. Nor have we yeah. looked ahead to the the two future editions and quite how we would structure them curatorially. Um, I know in, an, in a couple of meetings we threw about ideas of whether you might invite an international curator. I, I rather radically proposed curating each other's spaces, which was met with a kind of deafening, I like slightly that horrified idea, silence. <laughs> I think that's, that's de-territorialising it. quickly died, <laughs> died to death. But it is that interesting idea. to think of precedents in that area, and uh, I'm thinking here of the 1988 Australian Biennale, which was the, uh, and that was the sole the edition annual, of the Australian Biennale. One annual in Melbourne. Uh, mean? No. no. Oh, no, no. no. What are you talking about? This, so this was 88. It was actually the Biennale of Sydney and it toured. Um, so uh, it, was the, it was retitled Australian Biennale for that edition. 
Um, and it was just a single edition, and I wonder if that might not be informative in thinking about the national and its tour ability. What happens? We need a rest for a show. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, actually, actually, see how it goes. See how the see how British people. Art Show is an interesting model because it started uh, organised by the Hayward Touring and uh, it started only in the regional museums. And then people started to complain after so many times, maybe eight times or nine times, why does it happen in London? So it's only recent that it happened at the Hayward. Um, in terms of like other models that outside of particular exhibitions that might um, influence your thinking on the events that you're working on. For example, Mami, is there other yes. non-biennial examples oh, yes. that are um, important to what you're doing? At uh, Mori Art Museum, we have a series of uh, triennial exhibition called Ropongi Crossing, which uh, taking a name from the actual existing uh, traffic crossing. And uh, it's, it's really about the same framework of uh, uh, the Japanese contemporary arts artist of that time. But uh, we had been, uh, from the very beginning, we had been inviting uh, guest curators to work with the institutional curators. And in uh, 2013, when I did with Ruben and also Gabriel Rita, to have a wider spectrum of Japanese art, to include Japanese artists or Japanese Australian artists or uh, US based artists, to have a wider spectrum. And uh, yeah, it's it's been interesting to work with the external curators, partly for me to invite Ruben and also Gabriel from the United States, was uh, the, with the hope that by doing researches in, in Japanese art, he may take some of the artists or knowledges uh, out to the outside of Japan so that he can explore in Australia or elsewhere and uh, Gabriel could do something or extension of that version in the US or elsewhere. So that it's uh, aiming to open up the seed. So I kind of planted some seeds to those uh, guest curators from Which outside. Which links back, I think, to what you're suggesting, Nina, that could be part of the Nationals' future if there's other external curators involved in some way or another. Possibly. Yeah, and obviously it's it's not just up to me. It would need <laughs> lengthy discussion with my uh, co-curators. Um, Ruben, in terms of models that might now influence the APT and its direction that it's heading now, um, if you've got particular things you can say about that? Uh, I mean, it's, it's maybe worth recapping the way that the curatorial model for the APT has evolved um, because um, it, it has shifted over time. Um, not just in terms of the presentation, so I mentioned um, the very first edition had these kind of quite no national focused displays that um, were then much more dispersed from, uh, from the second APT. Um, but uh, the, um, the gallery um, collaborated a lot with um, co-curators from uh, a lot of the regions that it visited. Um, and then uh, right up until uh, 1999, which had an extraordinary curatorium of something like, and I say something like because there's no exact figure, uh, 52 um, curators having their input on the show. <laughs> Um, so, um, so... Is that like one artist, one curator? <laughs> <laughs> Nearly. Um, There's got to be a collective a bespoke now. What, what was it? I think it was like, uh, never before have so few been curated by so many, I think was the, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> was the quote at the time. But um, the, the exhibition evolved after that and it was interesting because it initially, um, like the National, been intended as a um, three edition show. Um, and each of those uh, first three editions had um, you know, rough framework um, that uh, was a, a, a kind of progression of past, uh, present, future. Um, partly to really uh, help explore the, um, the, you know, vast and rich modernities throughout the region. Um, and here I come back to this idea of actually kind of challenging um, this, this framework of a, um, of a singular um, modernity that's, that's uh, evolves out of New York and Paris and London, you know. Um, and it, it, uh, by the, the time of the future um, uh, edition, um, you know, there were a number of staff changes, there were a number of shifts within the institution. Um, GOMA, uh, the construction of a new building, was on the horizon. Uh, so the model shifted actually quite radically um, to 
uh, an exhibition that was um, curated in-house and that really significantly reduced the number of artists so that they, uh, each artist was displayed in depth. Uh, so I think it was 19 uh, in that fourth edition. Um, and while the number of artists involved in the project has um, increased since that time, since the opening of GOMA, which has uh, given us a lot more floor space, it's a real, I mean, it's a real practicality question. Um, the, uh, the curatorial model has stayed largely in-house. I say largely because um, we now have established um, positions. We have an Asian and Pacific art department in which has specialist curators in um, Asian and Pacific art. Um, and uh, we have a, a terrific team of colleagues within the broader curatorial department working in international um, Australian art and in cinema who uh, also contribute um, uh, to the project. Um, but we work um, with co-curators uh, in particular areas. Um, sometimes we um, collaborate with artists to um, create workshops to develop work, um, to find uh, ways to take um, modes of practice that um, may not appear immediately um, uh, amenable to a kind of a museum situation um, to be able to kind of um, translate those practices um, for an audience that, that, that's coming to a museum. Um, so there's a, there's a range of things that are available to us now. And um, its future, do you imagine that it will stay within Quag Goma? I mean, is there the potential for it to reach out in terms of its connectivity with institutions in Brisbane or the city yeah, itself? And th there's always that potential. Now, I think there's always been that potential. Um, it's, I mean, it is, it is distinguished by the fact that it is an, uh, a single institution um, triennial, which uh, puts its own inflections on the way that the exhibition manifests. Um, it's also distinguished, um, you know, as I mentioned before, by not having a single artistic director. Um, but, but, you know, being uh, much more of, um, you know, an institutional construction in a way. Um, there certainly is that potential. I mean, not with the, the forthcoming edition, but, um, yeah, we really are, um, are working very hard on the, on the next edition and haven't thought too far ahead at this point. Um, coming back to what Nina said about also the idea of the kind of curatorial vision and an artistic vision being you know, a singular voice or rather a kind of collaborative or group voice. Um, with your Sydney Biennale mummy, you've elected to work with you uh, principally, but obviously you know, it also involves um, working closely with a number of key organisations in Sydney. Do you want to talk a little bit about that for decision, your, you know, the direction you've taken it and why? Uh, yes. Um I, I do a lot of collaborative uh, curation, including Wapungi Crossing, and then also my 2012 uh, Guangzhou Biennale was uh, six women uh, Asian artist directors. And uh, for the upcoming Southeast Asian Sabi show that we are doing in collaboration with the National Art, Gal Art, Art Center in Tokyo, it's two institution collaboration. Uh, we invited four additional uh, Southeast Asian young curators. So we are working with like 14 curatorial team. So it's been always a different uh, model. And so when the, uh, the Sydney Biennial suggested me, oh, mommy, would you like to have assistant curators? And uh, I thought, wait a minute, maybe I can do it. I can try to do it myself. I just wanted to see how it works. And uh, it, it's, I'm not saying that I, I can do it everything by myself, but uh, the more towards the way that I wanted to really collaborate with existing institutions. Because uh, it's important for me to work with the people who has better knowledge than me, particularly on Australian art. So it doesn't make sense to me in coming in and then do some very sort of superficial research and pick some artists and uh, sort of pretend that I know some of the Australian art. And I, I wasn't uh, feeling comfortable. So, uh, but also I wanted to work with the collection of the institutions too, that uh, um, it's, it's very interesting to work with the institutions 
which the collecting institution has in-depth sort of studies and scholarly researches on uh, Australian art. So uh, it was just natural to see how some of those works within the collection could speak in dialogue with some of the works from the international art scene so that sort of create new uh, uh, conversations from Australia. So uh, if, we w if I work with my sort of colleagues in uh, different institutions, I thought maybe I didn't need uh, any more curators or on a platform. And I think also um, from when we've discussed previously that you were keen to, which I think people often say, um, not have too many artists, that so you're also working, wanting to work more um, closely with fewer artists. I think that's often the intention when um, artistic directors come into a Biennale model, they're like, you know, going to par it back, we're just going to, it's going to be great. But then there's a lot of pressures that are put on you to add people, add countries and things as you move along. Have you been able to um, restrain from that pressure to date? <laughs> I'm very good at saying no. <laughs> and because it's, it's, it's better for both of us. And it's not good for the artist to be invited to just given small space, so small budget. And uh, something to make this kind of uh, major festival of the city into a uh, great opportunity is uh, to give substantial opportunities for every artist. So I'm just trying to towards that way. And uh, yeah, just something to uh, make a different experience from uh, the normal like a group show. Um, so in terms of the collaboration of the national, I mean, I have... What are the quotation marks well, around that for, I, Charlotte? Well, I just have that <laughs> collaboration, I think, is actually pretty tough. I think people talk about working together or a kind of institutional collaboration as in a kind of coming together, which I think is one thing. But, like, true collaboration is different because it involves um, different relationship to one's ego and to finding some kind of common ego outside of the individual. I don't know, just personal view. <laughs> but um, there's a, you know, an idea of collaboration that's nice and um, has a lot of goodwill about it, is still a good thing. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your collaboration, um, who the key people are in it and why they are the key people and um, how you came together and your working methodology, I suppose. Yeah, I'm, uh, on, on the, on, um, in addition to it, I'm also interested in how you worked together, like uh, bringing up the list of the names, and how did you divide into three venues? You just picked the We want to know like, the nitty gritty. <laughs> Now's the time, you've got to do it. I know there, there has obviously been a lot of int interest in this, and I think it's partly fueled by the fact that um, there's been a sort of recent glasnost in a sort of thawing, I think, in the relations between um, the institutions here in Sydney. Um, I mean, it's the reality of institutions anywhere that you are, there is a degree of competition because of money and funding and things like that. But, I mean, I think what you're saying is that there's been a willingness to put some of those things aside. Absolutely, and I think a recognition that, you know, um, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And um, I, th I think personally, it feels like it's come quite late in the day here in Sydney. Um, I think there has been, um, at least in my experience, much more, a, a, a much more kind of receptive attitude towards um, institutional collaboration uh, in London, at least where I, you know, I was based for many years. Um, I can't speak to anywhere else. But um, in terms of, of our process, once once the overall framework had been determined by the three directors of the institutions, we began a series of monthly curatorial meetings, and um, and that I guess they were sort of you know flirtations. You know there was that awkward moment where we did the big reveal. We we'd each been pursuing our independent lines of inquiry and kind of research interests and and conduct, conducting studio visits, and in some cases some artists had to probably field. You know, all it, of us, it, all of us in quick succession, um, and then we started with long lists and 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 we placed them on the table and we started talking to them and um, you know the dialogue became more energetic and rigorous and and we sort of through that process over a period of 
probably 18 months or so, arrived at a selection of 48 artists um, who we then had to house. And I think to that end, I mean, like you said, collaboration is, it is, it can be difficult and it can be challenging and, and there are, each institution has its own kind of entrenched um, cultural and intellectual contexts and programming priorities and, and budgets well. and yeah, decision-making processes. And um, I guess we just kind of uh, bumbled, bumbled through it, <laughs> felt, our, you know, felt our way through it. And um, we were keen in terms of how each artist was housed and where they were housed. We were sort of keen to respect the existing DNA of the institutions. That was sort of important for, for all of us, I think. So at Carriage Works, you do have fo a focus on artists with a, um, a performative dimension to their practice or who maybe who work in kind of larger scale installation. Um, yeah, so work to your strengths. Perhaps, although so. it also would have been natural probably to have the emerging artists at Carriage Works mid-career at the MCA and established at the Art Gallery, and I think that's we, we certainly haven't done that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's cross-generational at each site. Um, so it does feel, to my mind, from the inside, like it was a, a single exhibition developed collectively. No argument. It was very, no, it was actually incredibly yeah. generous, Mammy, the process. they're not going to tell us <laughs> if they did anyway, are they? But also, I don't. Oh, I don't think we could have vetoed. Uh, you know, it would have. Yeah. It would have been very ungenerous to, kind of, start vetoing each other's artists for any particular yeah. reason. Is the cross generational aspect um, really, really important within the whole framework? I mean, is that what you're most um, c passionate about? doing and saying with this kind of... It was of an aspect of it. Um, we were more, I mean, I think when we started the research, we probably, each of us had some artists we were already interested in working with already. Uh, that's one of the ways that Annika and I approached it. Um, we had a handful of artists whose practice we were looking at quite closely at that moment in time. We expanded out from that. And as it developed, each institution had a particular thematic cluster from the bigger group of artists. So there's, there's three iterations of one exhibition which have come from this process, which are closely interconnected, but each institution has retained a personality in that exhibition in a thematic cluster. Um, I, I thought the process was incredibly rewarding to sit down with colleagues, talk about ideas, talk about the practice, talk about the studios you've been to. Um, certainly at the curatorial level, I didn't feel we had any conflict in that process. I mean, it's a real I'm opportunity a to share knowledge, <laughs> really, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And I, mean, I, think I really enjoyed it from yeah. a professional point of view. And it, it you know, we did, um, I've obviously, I've been out of the country for many years, so, so my um, knowledge of Australian art was probably, <laughs> the, you know, not quite matching certainly Wayne and Blair's. But, um, you know, we all had blind spots, I guess. And, and um, I certainly became aware of, artists who I wasn't necessarily aware of before through through speaking to my colleagues and do you think um, Ruben and I were talking just before um, also about how you some of your institutional thinking becomes so embedded in you that I mean to collaborate to work between institutions can be also be a very good kind of opportunity to um, test that or have it challenged or even just to rethink it and that's probably like one of the benefits of collaborating or Yeah, I mean, together. you know, you go elsewhere in the country and often, you know, it might be a, um, a location that you don't know that well. Obviously, we, we live in Sydney. These are our homes. We're not in so you know, detailed uh, embeddedness or knowledge of other places. And you might have colleagues in that place that are helping you through that. But I was very aware for the, you know, and it, something that was completely different to anything I'd done before. I might be in an artist studio or a series of conversations with, a, with another curatorial colleague in another in another city, and be looking at work or having a conversation with artists, thinking in terms of the art gallery of New South Wales. Mm. You know, maybe this artist is not quite going to work in a certain way or this practice of other things that we're thinking about the MCA. But actually, I wonder how they would work with the gallery and knowing what Wayne and Annika are thinking about, or how they might work with carriage works, and to sort of be able to come back and go, well, you know, if you're going to Perth, maybe you should go and see, you know, this person, that person, the other. There in th you know, there's something really interesting going on. It certainly did sort of mean that you were not thinking purely in terms of the parameters and the conventions of how you might work in your institution. Mm. But um, we did ultimately take that responsibility about making sure that what we, what we were finally working with in our organisation was something that, you know, in a sense held to certain qualities that organisation and its audiences have. 
I think the other thing about collaboration, and I know we're here to talk about curatorial practice, but I think it's been really quite profoundly important across the institutions. So, you know, our communications teams working together, really sharing knowledge, sharing processes, sharing thinking. Um, our digital teams working together to Education. build a website, education teams, etc. Marketing program. teams, publicity, yeah. all those all things. That, I mean, it's all behind the scenes, but it actually has been, I think, quite profound the way in which we think about how we can share and work together and where our common commonalities are. Blair, I think that's a really important point. If I might just jump in here, sorry, Charlotte. Um, that, um, and I think it sets up uh, something that's perhaps problematic about um, the thinking about uh, the critical framework for exhibitions being this authorial, authorator, authorial curatorial model um, and that there are much greater infrastructural concerns um, at work in the way that the exhibition is structured and indeed experienced um, by its audiences. Um, there's often not, um, there's no direct feed from the curator to the audience. It's something that's actually uh, much more dispersed in the contribution to these projects and their limitations actually comes from uh, the infrastructure that goes into building them. And it comes in in the title. I mean, in many ways, much of the really core initial critical thinking about what's happening in this country right now and how we want to position this came through actually trying to think about what the hell are we going to call it. <laughs> and, you know, because the, the title, the national which we arrived at, is very complex and quite provocative um, and potentially off-putting in certain ways. And that opened up a lot of conversations in the curatorial group, but actually, you know, speaking from the MCA's point of view, you know, it's not just the curators that will work out titling and presentation. So the conversations we had within the museum around title options with comms, marketing, uh, you know, audiences, etc., thinking through what we were trying to present and how we were trying to present it as a museum was really important. How Can do you think that works with the artists involved? in the exhibition. I think one you know. thing we did do is that once we had settled on the artists for each venue, we then managed, each institution managed the artist into that venue. So, because we have got separate DNAs in how we work, it was the most effective way to make it happen. And actually it was, became interesting, some of the things which we couldn't resolve collaboratively were the artist contracts. We actually have a legal contract which is already put in place, signed off by our organisations in many levels. So there were things like that where differences still remained. Um, before I come to Christian saying I do want to say also about the collaboration it wasn't just between the institutions within the art gallery Annika Jaspers and I collaborated as well and that was incredibly important for the DNA of our show um, and our exhibition really reflects a very big input from Annika so it was me as a senior person who'd done many exhibitions within the institution and looked after contemporary art for a long time to actually let go of that, listen to another voice, a younger voice engaged with artists, some of whom I hadn't worked with or didn't know of, and bring that in into the institution was incredibly important for us. And, um, and I think that's reflected in the exhibition we have. It's a different curatorial voice than you may have seen in our institution previously. So even those sort of within the institution collaborations beyond all the other teams, but just curatorially became very important I think working into it. So, and that's reflected in the artist experience as well, I hope. Um, I mean, Annika was able to work much more closely with the artists than I could on realising the project. And I think that sort of very sort of um, engaged process of developing the work with them for the institution, I certainly hope was a good experience. I think it's ended up with some very good artworks. So. And the kind of the lead time between you and your organisations um, to develop the project, but then also. I mean, has there been a similar lead time with the artists? You know, was the the seed of the exhibition then to deciding on this final list and how much time you had to work with artists? Did I mean? We would have Did liked more time. Well? You yeah. always want more time you to work with artists. always want more time. But I mean, and and there was a lot of working out what we were doing yeah. before so we really started. So some of the same principles, could they mm. be applied, I suppose, to the relationship yeah. with the artist and how... And one of the do. reasons for setting it up to just do it the three times is to think about it actually as a single project, although there will be different curators involved each time. You know, the organisations remain involved or running it. There are uh, voices and understandings in those organisations, as I say, way beyond the curatorial. And so, although there's the same sort of two years between each one, in a sense we're already working up to 19 and 21 in certain ways amongst um, the way in 
which we're working together as organisations, hopefully to enable a greater amount of time to work with individual artists. So, you know, we spent a lot of the last 18 months building a website, working out how to do a book together for the first time, you know, how to, how to do all those things together for the first time. Now we've done it. We've kind of got that. So hopefully we can actually focus that temporal element, you know, getting very earlier into the conversations with artists for the next show. Which would be a really good outcome. And in terms of the relationship to commissioning new work and perhaps um, also collecting or acquisitions, i.e. the way that APT works, is that a dimension of this exhibition or is it not and why? It is for the collecting institutes and that's another difference in our DNA. I mean, Carriage Works is not a collecting institute, but um, uh, for us absolutely, the perspectives, the biennales, all of our contemporary curatorial projects tend to feed into the collection. We can bring artists in, we can work with them to uh, create, make and deliver works into our spaces, into our buildings, which can then have a life into the future. I mean, obviously we don't have the resources to keep everything, but there's certain works we're, which were acquisitive commissions and other ones which we've committed to purchase and it's another way to help fund the project rather than having to draw money in from other sources we can use the money we have for acquisitions to help as well um, none of which is government money it's all through private benefaction resources sponsorship etc so I've just realized we've nearly gone over I've gone against what I promised um, in terms of questions or comments from audience anyone got burning question yeah um, just, <laughs> just following on from your recent comment about funding and Mammy's comment about wanting to invest in artists with the Biennale to make larger, sort of more ambitious work and also looking at the instability and uncertainty around funding for the arts. How do you guys feel with the National as an Australian review of, of contemporary art and also commissioning new art, how do you feel like this exhibition contributes to the landscape of contemporary Australian art and contributes to the sustainability of art practice when um, spons sponsorship or government support is so tumultuous at the moment? It's a great question actually and one of the, there were several reasons we committed to three exhibitions over six years. Uh, one is not wanting to tie our institutions and future curators into a model they may not want to continue with and may not be so relevant in the future. They've got the option to continue if they want. The other one is the financial side to it. We felt confident we could commit um, from our institutional budgets, sponsorship, etc., to three exhibitions over a six-year period. But um, as you say, the financial situation can change very quickly. Um, in terms of this one, we did apply for uh, all sorts of government funding. Um, we hit the George Brandis Destroy the Australia Council model. So with money being stripped out, we went through the Australia Council, we tried Catalyst, we tried many things. We didn't secure that. Interesting enough for this model, um, we found uh, corporate and private benefaction um, really came on board for it. We, we did it individually as well as the collective uh, government approaches. We then approached individual sponsors um, and they were very, very open to it. So I'm very confident the art gallery, we have enough money to deliver the next three with a suitable level of support for the artists to develop and make new work for it. So. I, I think know. part of your question is like um, how you see this event as being generative for mm. Australian artists or for Australian culture. Is that right? I think we're kind of lacking a lot in Australia is that opportunity for criticality and for engagement and for development because we're so isolated from the international conversations in a lot of ways. Providing a platform where artists can get that input is so significant and, and how that's actually contributing to the ongoing sustainability and tapestry of of creative process in Australia. We've also invited um, a number of international visiting curators here over the course of the run of the exhibition, which has been supported by DFAT, um, again, to try and kind of make those global connections and, uh, and, and get some international exposure for the Australian art. I think there's also something in your question about that idea of creating long run opportunities for artists and we've talked a lot about attempting to work into more of a commissioning model as we move through the project which is also about securing funds getting ourselves set understanding how how we can work together and in the, and developing those relationships with artists we are, are able to better fund production or 
even better fun time over extended periods of times for the conversations that enable work to emerge. And we've done it in one or two instances to move forward into the next next show, but it's something we want to work more closely on. And I think that the other part, other answer I'd have to your question is something we moved on from, that touring model, why, why to Sydney or whatever. And I think touring is a difficult and sometimes problematic idea about moving round objects, but we are very conscious of being where we are and thinking about some of those kind of critical programs or public programs or, or even professional workshop type models if we can secure the funding for that type of activity to move out around the country. So in a sense, we can learn from others elsewhere and as we're going. And expand we're the going. dialogue. Exactly. I think the critical framework also comes from the catalogue, the 35 authors, and that forums like this, the chance to look at the practice and think this is what the curators have selected as being practice which should be in the exhibition, um, and to set up frameworks around that for discussion, review, etc. And we certainly hope that dialogue will ensue from the exhibition. So. I think uh, I wanted to uh, add on to your question that it's really important that the Nationals started to become one of the, the seed for uh, international visitors or international professionals to see there is something going on in Sydney or in Australia instead of looking at individual institutions. And uh, that's another uh, hope that I had to work on the Sydney Biennial is that uh, it's, it's not about uh, competition or any single sort of art event. It's really about how to uh, upgrade the whole, whole spectrum of the, uh, the, what is really going on in this, on this country, together with APT. So it's really a uh, uh, pity if one starts thinking about another competition, but it's, it's really how to make it look like a much bigger event that uh, everything is happening every day. And uh, so I think it's a really important for the Australian artist to be part of this larger dialogue. And then uh, the, all of these uh, institutions or events becomes some sort of energy point, the feel that uh, from outside it, it, people have to feel it. Blair, do you want to talk to that? Yeah, we organised it. I mean, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, gone off. Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade have um, have always, or for a number of years, funded an international business program for events like the AT and and Biennale. In addition to that program, I think you're referring to, that came through the Australia Council. Yes, yes. So the DFAT program's been um, been operating for a while. They tend to like to work. With a, with a large event and a number of visitors, rather than sort of one one-off activities, the terms of engagement are simply to support people to come here. There are no solid contractual outcomes that are required. Um, they do ask that the um, the embassy or consulate in that in that home um, location that the curator is coming from may may make contact with the curator, may want a little bit of feedback and formal from the visit, or maybe want to come to a social event or something. But there's no locked-in um, you know, terms that they need, that no, no locked in outcomes or outcome expectations other than to just build that kind of awareness and understanding of contemporary Australian culture. In, independent of the outcomes, I think it's an entirely commendable process and uh, I congratulate those of you on the podium and all of your staff and uh, colleagues who've been involved. But my fascination is with the name and with the provocative name that you've chosen and I wonder if you take a moment to tell us what other names got leapfrogged? <laughs> oh, there was a lot of sort of fairly um, non-specific, uh, evocative Rather titles, earnest, earnest titles. Yeah, no, uh, Meridian was that one? Or was it? No, we've already done Meridian. You've done Meridian. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I think in the end, we, we did have a long discussion about titles and they did, a lot of them were these quite poetic titles which in the end meant nothing and become brands like Perspecta. It actually becomes a brand. So we thought, should we create something which just becomes a marketing thing to bring it together? We're doing a show which is Australian artist based, so let's actually just own that 
and let's push some buttons. I mean, during the 18 months of development, of course, it did shift the landscape we're working. And 18 months ago, we were worried about the national being mistaken for the band. Um, about halfway through, of course, we had to deal with, with three calls the way through, deal with Brexit, with Trump coming into power in America, with Pauline Hansen's resurgence here. So the whole idea of nation, nation stay in the national, gather the whole new political momentum, which was there from the beginning, but the provocation, I think, became even more important later on. And the catalogue, the essays, uh, three of the commissioned essays are dealing very strongly with the idea of what Australia is, doesn't mean anything, what the national is what nationalism is and to actually have that discussion in an art context uh, where we often still deal with ideas of artists in places was a very important thing. We'll get to you Agatha. <laughs> A while ago, uh, Charlotte, you said something about the three different organisations having different DNA. Oh, Nina said that, and different audiences. So in terms of the dialogue across the three of you, I'm totally fascinated to know, since it's a free show, how you're going to track audience attendance and how you're going to think about that and if social media plays a role in that tracking. Because this is... The ag aggregated, you can count heads, yeah. but I'd like to know a little bit about yeah. your thinking about how to understand your audiences. Yeah, well, there have been, um, probably just a, to follow on to something Wayne said earlier, there have been little pockets of funding we've managed to draw into elements from public purse, um, around the website from the City of Sydney and, and uh, I think Gordon Darling Foundation for the book. And, the, and another one has actually been through state government um, to assist in audience surveying. So, and one of the key things we're looking at through that, and it's a really, I mean, the things you always look at about demographics, etc., why you've come, what's interesting, etc., but we're actually looking at why and how people are moving between the organisations. Does, is this show generating that movement of, of people that might be regular gallery goers but not going to carriage works, and might be carriage works, more performance orientated goers that are not coming here. So we are actually tracking that. Social media also does play an important role and, and it's one of the areas where as well as running our own individual social media channels as we always do, we do have aggregate channels for the national too. Uh, just listening now, it strikes me that in the collaboration that we hear a lot about, the almost like the most obvious thing that is the product of that collaboration is the name, The National. And it's very hard not to see the strength of that name as a type of um, curatorial device that you then deploy artists to answer. And um, I can't see how if the National has three iterations that it will ever be able to have another curatorial device because the title is so strong that it will continue to be the question that drives the exhibition and the artist's response to being included. Um, I just wanted to see if you had had any thoughts about that and if you think of artists as offering ways to answer questions that you might have as curators. I think that's a really good question. Um, we did chew over the title for a rather long time. I think we sort of dismissed it initially um, because we were worried it was going to um, reaffirm the idea that we were trying to make some sort of grand statement about um, national tendencies. or. Um, and it was only when, when we stopped and thought more about its kind of rather playful nature and even even how similar it is to, you know, it sounds like a horse race, that we actually returned to it and started unpicking it and thinking that perhaps there was something more there. But I think uh, from memory we arrived at the title fairly late in the day when mm -hmm. most of the artists um, had been selected and and were, were already embarking on making work. So I don't, and thinking through the works in the show I don't think too many of them have felt obliged to answer that question, um, but I do think it's an interesting one for future iterations of the exhibition. I guess it's not that they well, like, like I might feel obliged, but, um, <laughs> but I don't think other artists might necessar necessarily feel obliged, but their practice answers the question in a way yeah. for you. Um, I, I was I just thinking about that so as a curatorial a, it's device. A kind of 
dominant lens in which very hard not to see see it through that lens yeah which is an interesting observation and I think um, the title's relevance became clearer after we were selecting artists when the artists practice um, because you have for us to actually approach an exhibition which um, the key structuring factor was it was Australian initially. It was an Australian survey of contemporary art. We went out there to see what was happening, which practices we were interested in. We were bringing those together. Um, and the title did come later, but the practices we were seeing um, uh, were addressing many things out there in the world and being in the world many ways. Um, and the fact that they didn't add up to a nation state, I think, became a very interesting factor for us. So, which probably in some ways led to that title adhering, because the exhibition will never be that title. Um, I think as a provocation the first time will be discussed more, I think in the future iterations, like Perspective, it will be perhaps become more of a brand instead. But some artists are definitely addressing it directly, which is great, and others, their practice is there doing what it does, so. Mummy, I wonder if, if that has happened with the British Art Show. I didn't, I didn't work on the British art show. So. No. <laughs> I mean, th I do want to return to the fact that it's not just a curatorial provocation, it's an institutional provocation. If it, if it exists as a lens and or provocation, it's beyond the curatorial, it, or it includes, but it's beyond the curatorial. And I think we were all aware as we were, we were brainstorming those titles within our organisations and together, um, that it was going to be about more than the show. You know, it'll be other curators who also may feel determined by that title coming through in, in the next couple. And, and it made me think about that, sorry, that early question about not, no, titles that we, we discarded. I mean, we did want to create something that had a certain sense of remembrance and identity to it. And we didn't want to cross over into other territory. I mean, it's, a, it's also just a very practical institutional thing. So there is already a biennial of Australian art, a late biennial of Australian art. Those, those words, have a kind of resonance in a certain place in a certain show that it's not our place to kind of step into and try and pull from. There already is a Biennale in Sydney, although we have talked about the other reasons why we don't see this as a Biennale. So those, those practicalities also came, came into it. And, and it can change, that's the other thing. Next one may be the unnational. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's, um, it, I mean, it's interesting because there are a number of assumptions um, I think that we've, that we've already um, built into our response about the national. And th I guess the, the question that I would I'd raise, like um, extending from your question, is the question of which nation. And it's something that um, is certainly um, problematized, having very, very quickly seen um, the exhibition, not really thought it through before I talk. Um, but uh, in, in Archie Moore's work, for example, the Carriage Works, um, and or in um, Taloi Havini's work um, in at the, at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, um, you know, looking at, at at histories of Australian colonialism, effectively, um, so there, there there's a there's room, I think, uh, perhaps within that title to actually kind of think beyond this this concept of the Australian nation state. And then also, I think any shows like APT Asia Pacific, what does it mean? And I think it's really important that everyone, not only the curators and an artist, but also audience, to think what does it mean by the Australian art. What does it mean by the national? I think it's a very, very uh, important question that we have to keep asking all the time. I think we might leave it there. It's a good note to end on. So please join me in thanking all of our speakers. Thank you very much. <laughs>